for you. All right, so I'll get started with whoever we got here. Um, greetings, everyone. I am now Knight Graybeard. Um, last year, I did this discussion while I was on the road during one of my jobs, so I had a very echoey hotel room. Hopefully, this year, it sounds much better sitting here in my home office. Um, so I am here to describe and discuss the Norse paganism view on Jediism and how it all intertwines together. Um, if any of you attended the shamanistic point of view, you'll hear a lot of the same things. Um, a couple of the same ideas come out as well. Um, I will say first and foremost, when I decided to switch from Christianity to Norse paganism about 16 years ago, I did not know the amount of research and study that would come with this this path in my life. I have read um, chronicles dating back from the 11th century, a little before, trying to find unaltered documentation documentation looking for writings on the Hanval, which is the pretty much is the life guide for uh, Norse pagans that did not have a Christian influence. And one of the ones I found was actually from my TM it told me to get the Wanderer's Hanval, which is pretty straightforward. There's all kinds of different versions you can get of it. I got a guy from Brooklyn that wrote his own who was absolutely hilarious if you read his stuff. But you can see this is just one of my shelves. This is just the basic stuff. All the other stuff is on the other side of the room. And I'm not going to show that because I'm kind of like a book horde. I'm a book dragon. I hoard a books for fun. So there's probably about 30 more books on that side of the room. Just seeing with Norse paganism and everything else. Even here on my desk, I've got a, a couple different more, a couple different books here for paganism as well. Especially the Norse paganism. Um, one of the things I will say for being Norse pagan is it is not a Viking. A large portion of society, when I tell them Norse pagan, oh, you're a Viking. No, no, I'm not a Viking. A Viking was an occupation, much like a farmer, a tradesman, craftsman, and such. If I were to go around my entire life acting as a Viking, I would have a lot more cool stuff in my house. Let's face it. Um, for those of you that don't know, the uh, the Vi the uh, the Nords in 874 took all the gold and silver from the Paris Olympics. If you don't know what that is, look up the history of this, when they kind of raided Paris and stole everything. Um, so Norse pagan does not relate to being a Viking at all. It is not the Viking culture. It's not the Viking mindset to be Norse pagan is to be a spiritualist, meaning you are looking at the practical side of life every day. The three tenets that we basically follow is family, kin, and faith in that order. If I take care of my family, my family will take care of me. If I take care of my kin, my kin will take care of me. And if I take care of my faith, my faith will take care of me. But you've got to, you got to focus first and foremost what's most important. What, what you have at home is the most important thing to you. When it comes to common misconceptions, one of the things I have to deal with a lot is I've been called evil. I've been called a heretic. I've been called a heathen, which is the term that we use nowadays. Um, it was it was a derogatory term at one time in history. We have, we have now changed it to be our own term. And to be a heathen is to, yep, there you go. To be a heathen is to be yourself. First and foremost, and at all times, be yourself. Um, the best way I can describe a relation to Norse paganism is it, it's, it's a spiritualistic faith. You are looking for the divine in you, first and foremost, trying to find your own link to it at all times. You should always be linked to, to your own divinity and your own feelings. If it doesn't make sense in your heart, does it make sense in your head, it's not going to be right for you. So you have a lot of people who struggle trying, trying to find that balance and they can't find it. Now, being heathen doesn't mean you can't adopt all other cultures or other practices in, into your into your faith faith. There's nothing wrong with that. If you look at the Norse pantheon of the gods that we have, uh, Odin, Odin, Woden, Gladimir, I mean, he's got probably 5,000 names. I can't find them all. I can't pronounce them all. I'm not going to try to pronounce them all. I am from Midwest farmland. I do not speak Old Norse. Um, I call him Woden. That's how I inter interact with him. But um, Odin, as he's commonly known as, was the wanderer. It means he would leave Asgard and wander the nine realms. He would go out and look for new things that he did not know. He would go out and look for things that he wanted to know, wanted to learn. Go look for things that he could better himself and bring back and and learn on. Uh, for those who don't know, he hanged from he hung himself from the tree Yggdrasil by his ankles and pierced his side for seven days to learn the uh, the Nordic runes. Um, so everything about the Nordic Norse pagan side of it is learning about everyone else. 
that's great. I love that aspect of it. And that's one thing that I love about the temple as well. The temple has never told me, well, you have to follow A, A, B, and C. It allows me to follow my own path, to experience things in my own way, and let me learn deeper about who I am and what I actually believe. There is nothing wrong with looking for other ways to learn. So long as you're being true to your head and being true to your heart, you can never go wrong in life. One of the things that I love to do here in my office when I sit at home, and my wife calls me crazy sometimes, is I have my two ravens up here on top of my printer, Hugin and Mugen, which are Odin's ravens, which are known as thought and memory. Um, Odin was never afraid to send out thought, but he was always terrified of memory never returning. So what does that mean to me? Well, that means to me is that we have to remember who we are, where we came from, what we've been through in our life so we can progress further and further on. Um, when it comes to common misconceptions I've dealt with, especially in the military, it's I get a lot of funny looks, funny stares, because the military allows you to have beards one of two ways. You can have religious accommodation, which is what I have for my beard, or you can have the skin condition. Um, people consume whatever they want to about me. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. It's when people attack me personally that I have to be careful about. Because when people come, come at my faith, my first instinct is to react and respond back to them. But all that does is it starts a, na a nasty cycle of something that you don't want to keep going. You don't want to keep the hate going. There's nothing in my life that I'm ever going to say I hate. I I am not a fan of spiders. I'm arachnophobic. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding you. If I see a, a spider bigger than the size of a dime, I run screaming out the room. You don't believe me and call my wife in here. She'll tell you about it. Um, she kills all the spiders in the house. Um, I will kill everything else, but she's got to take care of the spiders. Um, so I know my limits. When it comes to learning anything new, I am all for it. As I sit here through the through the temple study hall for all the lessons that I can be here for, I listen to everyone talk. I, I find enrichment in everything that we do here. I cannot be a better me unless y'all help me be a better me. And that's one of the key paths of Norse paganism. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, the Norse paganism, we essentially have um, what's almost equivalent to the Ten Commandments. We have the nine noble virtues and for those of you who don't know what those is i have this lovely self plaque hanging on my wall so i'll hold here for a minute while y'all y'all take a glance at it make sure it's in the screenshot there you go and they're, they're pretty straightforward and simple there's nothing hidden about them these are all written and derived straight from the hanval in our day-to-day -day lessons and it's great for some of the simple things that we do in life they're very simple guides on which what we believe. You know, if we're talking about courage, to face your fears, defend family and kindred from all dangers. It goes back to the family, kin, and faith. If we look at self-reliance, it's to grow strong and learn skills you may, so you may earn your way in the world and not be a burden to others. Meaning, learn a trade. It doesn't have to be anything spectacular. It doesn't have to be a college degree. Go out and actually get a trade. Learn something that you can support yourself with. Uh, fidelity, for any of you who have ever been part of the Marine Corps or heard the Marine Corps, fidelity, be true to family, friends, kindred, and those whom you pledge your service. So I don't know um, how to explain this to a lot of people. It's kind of hard sometimes to explain it. But the military, when we enlist in the military, we gain another family. Um, I have deployed with people I did not know. I have been out 300 miles off, off the coast of the U.S. on a ship, not knowing the people I'm around. But after the first day, the guys are my brothers because I'm serving with them every day and doing things with them every day. I'm closer to some of my military friends. Actually, I am closer to my military friends than I am my own brother. Now, if you look at honor, stand by your oaths. Honor your ancestors by keeping your name pure among your kindred. Um, one of the thought processes with this is my name is not mine. So my last name doesn't belong to me. It never has and it never will. I am I am but a, a blip in the line of history that carries that name. So I'm going to do my best to give that name a positive reputation, a positive response to society. Um, industriousness, taking joy in labor, hold nothing back from the work you pledge to do. 
Um, this goes back to our last lesson on uh, follow your bliss. Now, if you're following your bliss and stuff that makes you happy, you can never go wrong in life. Uh, perseverance. Press on against hardships until your goal is met and you have done all you pledged you would do. Pretty much means if you say you're going to do something, follow through with it. Don't don't stop halfway through. Say it's too hard. And don't be afraid to ask for help. We're not perfect. Everyone needs help at some point in their life. I'm no exception. Uh, discipline. Do what is right and necessary of your own accord without threat or bribe. Um, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing? You know, it's there is nothing that you can do if you're doing the right thing that's going to come back and bite you in the butt. If I'm standing up for what is right and what needs to be done, I'm in the right. I'm going to I'm going to take that stance and that's the hill I'm going to stand on. Hospitality. One of my favorite things here is hospitality. Share food, drink and hearth with your friends, kindred and the weary traveler at your door. So anyone who walks through my front door or back door of my house, anyone that's visiting me gets um, guest rights which means why you are in my house, you are a part of my family. Um, this this also goes out to my daughters. They're, they're boyfriends, okay? I'm not too keen about this, but their boyfriends get guest rights as well. Um, there's several dads here on the block that have told their kids if something doesn't feel right or something goes kind of funky, go down to the one-story house here and knock on the door. They'll let you in. You don't have to be my kid, but you will have the same protection that I will offer my own children. At all times, no questions asked. If you're in my home, it is my job to take care of you. And finally, for the nine noble virtues, we have truth. Uh, seek the truth even when it's a hard truth. Only speak the words or stand in silence and always defend the truth from any who do not honor it. Um, we have a saying in in the uh, Chiefs Corps for my service to always speak truth to power. So I'm not going to tell you a falsehood. I'm going to tell you flat out. You know, you may like the answer, you may not like the answer, but it doesn't really matter. When the truth is there, the, the, the truth is the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. So that's the basic nine noble virtues that we live with. There's a lot more um, subtle ones that you can dig through if you want to. It's really up to you. A lot of people who study Norse paganism end up studying um, Hinduism, Buddhism. I've studied... Holy crap, I studied about almost every faith on the planet that you can think of. Um, I've looked into Shintoism. I've looked into a lot of the Eastern and Western traditions throughout Europe. Um, Norse paganism is not just to Scandinavian countries. It's also Germanic as well. So when you're looking at the faith, you're going to find different different words for it. You're going to find Ashtu uh, or Asatro. Um, Asha True is more of the Germanic faith, the Germanic gods sticking with just the Aesir. So just the like Odin, Uller, Freya, uh, Thor, Sif, and stuff like that. If you go to Asa Tro, it's more of the Rokir. So you get Loki, you get the fire giants, the ice giants, you get all the all the other deities as well. So you get the, the Vanir and the Roka. So for myself, I practice the Asa, Asa Tro. I go through all of it. It's also honoring the elements, honoring the earth as as is <laughs> as it is now. One of the hardest parts for anyone who's starting this path is just trying to find a starting point. When you're looking for a starting point, um, don't look too hard. I find a book that describes the tales of the gods. You can find them in Barnes and Noble. You can find them online. You can find websites with them. It doesn't matter where you start. Start reading the tales of the gods and start learning the lessons that they are trying to teach you. Um, one of the things that they teach, and it's it's almost universal across a lot of faiths, is you have what's known as the tricksters, gods who are deceitful, gods who do not do what they're supposed to do. Um, you can see it in the Marvel movies as well. Uh, the character Loki never had a beard in any of the Nordic tales. If he did, it was just a, just a little patch on his chin. And it doesn't matter which way you look, most of the tricksters don't have beards because to have a beard make, means that you're a man and you're going to honor your word. The tricksters didn't have one because they're still pulling the juvenile pranks. So a connection between a Norse pagan and his beard is something that's actually spiritual. It's if I have my beard, I have my honor. 
and no one can take my honor from me. So I have to be truthful at all times. If I do something that's against my my beliefs or I'm made to do something because it's an order from the military or I have to do something that I don't necessarily agree with, I have to ask myself, do I have to shave my beard? And my supervisors don't like that, don't like that statement because I told them if I come in with a shaved beard, you know I'm not going to agree with you. And everyone around is, is going to know I don't agree with you. So the, the truth, the power always comes into that point. So anyone who does start studying or start looking into the path, um, I want you to ask yourself three big questions. Three big questions first is why am I studying it? If it's to gain knowledge, I'm not going to lie. It's probably the right way to go. Um, you can never go wrong by studying something new. You should always be the eternal student. Um, I'm 43 years old. I got 24 years. I'm still learning things new every day. I love the new adventure. Well, I cannot be better unless someone helps me become better. And I'm never going to be perfect because I'm not going to be able to learn everything. Um, number two is after you ask yourself, you know, why I'm, the first question is, is this right for me? You know, it doesn't matter what faith you're studying or what path you're walking. If it doesn't resonate with your head and your heart, it's probably not the right path you should be on. And number three, you know, it's, is there anything I can do to make it better? Um, I am not a big fan of dragging other people down. I am not a fan of spreading hate and miscontents and or anger through anyone. And, uh oh. So there's a lot of things that you have to ask yourself. And if you're trying to make something better, your heart's in the right place. And you can't go wrong if your heart's in the right place. Um, for for family, I'm going to take care of anyone who comes in my house. For kin, I don't care what uniform you wear. If you're in my house, you get guest rights. And lastly, when you're going through a lot of this stuff and you're trying, trying to learn in general, don't be afraid to say, hey, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with the phrase, I don't know. If you find out, tell me, hey, I don't know. Okay, well, here, let me help. Let me help you so I can figure this out together. Um, all that being said, to be Norse pagan is a complicated path to walk for the individual because we have to figure out where we stand, what we believe, and what line we're not going to cross. Um, if you read a lot of my journal entries, you'll see me reference the uh, the warrior, the monk, and the statesman. And to be a Norse pagan, I really have to be all three. I have to be the warrior because it's better, it's a Japanese phrase, but it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Meaning I should be ready at all times to take action, but I'm not going to if I don't have to. Um, to be the monk is I have to train my spiritual self just as much as I train my physical self. I have to look after my spiritual health, my spiritual well-being, taking care of my mind and body together. And to be the statesman means I should always be seeking alternate paths rather than resorting to being the warrior. So I should always be willing to sit down and discuss and talk through issues to be the statesman, to be the, the mediator, the broker of truth, the broker of peace for all those around me. And that can be a difficult path sometimes. Um, I'm sure all of you would agree that there's some of those people in your life you'd rather just slap and walk away from. But what benefit does it have? You know, are you really being the, the bigger person? Are you being the better person? Are you being the best you you can be if you resort to that path? So to be the warrior, monk, and statesman is the line I have to walk every day. You know, yes, there is a time for action. But if there is a time for action, it's not to be the aggressor. It's to be the defender. If there's time to be the monk, the time for the retrospect, the inner inner seeking, the peace, seeking your quiet, uh, following your bliss, as we learned, learned in the last lesson, is key. And finally, when it comes to being the statesman, you know, am I doing everything I can to avoid becoming the warrior? Do I need to fall back more into the monk and give somebody um, more grace than compassion? 
you know, um, a good way to look at life is everyone should be treated with compassion and grace when you first meet them. It's for no other reason than compassion is understanding, hey, they may not know the path that I'm on. They, they don't know who I am. So let me help them figure it out. Um, if I'm starting a new job and I'm working with somebody who's brand new, I can't expect them to know what I know. I don't expect them to know what I know. Nobody can know what I know but me. No one's had my same life experiences. No one's walked my path but me. No one's put their foot, foot in my shoes and followed me for 43 years to learn what I know. So there's going to come a point in every interaction where I'm going to give somebody what's called that, that grace. I'm going to give them an understanding that, okay, yeah, you don't know. So let me explain it to you where I'm coming from. But I'm not going to do that every time. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a time when grace goes away and even compassion is going to go away. But there's also a difference when you treat somebody with compassion and grace. Um, if you have somebody new, you need, you need to be able to treat them with empathy as well. You know, understand where they're coming from, why they're acting the way they do, and why they don't understand what they do. Um, one of my jobs is naval firefighting. I don't expect everyone I know on, on my ships to know what I know. I don't expect everyone to know the fire science to the smallest detail like I do or how things interact or how things work. But they do need to understand with empathy that, hey, you know, this is going to happen one day. It's just a matter of time. So let me teach you how this can work. Let me show you what I know and how I felt. So when it does happen to you, you will know. But that goes the other way, too. If you're giving somebody compassion and grace and they're breaking down under stress, you've got to be able to sit down with them on their level and treat them with empathy. There's nothing worse than giving someone sympathy and tell them to get back to work. Okay, yeah, you feel bad. I get it. I'm sorry for you. Let's get up and go. No. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk for about an hour or so just so we can figure out what's actually going on, why you're having the difficulties that you're having. And majority of the time, it's it's so new, it's so much, I don't know what to do. Okay, well, let me help you. This is what I, I believe you should learn first. I will help you learn it. Because so when I give you that empathy and I treat you with compassion and grace, I can then educate you in whatever manner you need. So being Norse pagan, being able to connect the dots with everything. Um, one of the best ways I found to teach anybody is to use uh, cooking analogies and or sports analogies. It's probably the best way that those two groups tend to cross over pretty well when it comes to helping people learn. And I can't do that if I'm not looking or I haven't walked those different paths or studied those different paths as a Norse pagan. Um, so everything that I've learned in my life, I can I can fall back to education and following the, the path of Odin. By, by showing that, you know, hey, I'm here, I'm out here learning everything that I can, trying to be the best that I can be, knowing that I can never amount to the person who knows everything. No one's ever going to be perfect, no matter how much they want you to believe they are. Um, one of the funniest things I've learned in my life about being pagan is even Norse pagan, it doesn't matter, it scares a lot of people. And I don't understand why it scares a lot of people, but I can under, I can get the general gist of this because they don't know. So I will do my best over time to educate people. Um, but yeah, Norse paganism and the Jedi temple really mesh very well together. If you read through the lessons, it's all about learning who you are deeper inside. And that's basically the path of a Norse pagan is the more I can learn, the better I can be to help my fellow man. Um, that being said, I've been rambling for about 25, almost 30 minutes now. Does anybody have any questions? And I got the chat up. If anyone's got any questions or anybody want to bring up a topic? Um, I just want to say that I, I find all this stuff pretty fascinating. So I appreciate you, uh, you know, doing this and, you know, putting this together in like a comprehensive way to explain all your beliefs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I enjoy it. I mean, you really want to get technical about the complication of beliefs. I got a nice, nice Templar armor, the battle standard and the Norse pagan flag hanging in my office. So <laughs> people kind of come in and kind of look, kind of look funny at me, but yeah, no, there's more, more to me than just what people see. Oh, here's one from Tabby. How do you feel about Loki? Had to ask. It's a tradition now. She did this to me last year, actually. 
So I traditionally don't have a problem with Loki, but I'm not going out of my way to draw attention from Loki. So when it comes to to being Norse pagan, it's the Norse pagan gods are not paying, paying attention to what I do every day. They're gods. They really don't care. Um, I have to make myself noteworthy to them. I have to do something that's worthy of their attention. So if I'm doing something that, you know, if all, all I'm doing is pulling pranks lately and kind of being that guy, yeah, Loki might take might take interest in me. If I'm being the, the student studying everything, you know, Odin might take interest in me. If I'm standing standing the watch or standing guard, you know, Heimdall might take interest in me. Because despite what a lot of people think, it's the Norse pagan afterlife. There's every god has has his own home. Um, Heimdall stands at has a castle that stands at the the top of the Bifrost. So if he's taking interest into your life and showing that you're a good watchstander, you're a good guardian of the people, you could stand watch in his castle. If I show myself to be a um, a good woodsman, I could end up in Ulder's forest tending the yew trees. If I've always been the silent warrior and kept kept to myself and kept quiet, but stood there to defend everyone, I can be taken to Vidar's silent plane where no one speaks a word. So it's really, it's really who I want to draw attention to me. And Loki, yeah, not one of those guys. Not to be mean, Tabby, but yeah, he's not one of those guys. <laughs> Do you have a uh, a preferred uh, afterlife home that you that you'd like to to go to? Like yes, a, a preferred um, god have, that you want to be spend the time with. Oh yeah, if I have my way about it, I'm, I'm gonna go with Heim, Heimdall. Um, being military, I think it makes the most sense in my head, my head and my heart. Go stand the watch at the uh, the top of the Bifrost. It's one of the, it's if you look at the um the the nine realms of the of uh the Norse pantheon, Midgard is essentially the the center realm. It's the middle realm. Um, the Bifrost connects them all together and at the top where the Aesir are in Asgard is Heimdall's watchtower so much like the Marvel movie that globe that spun out and shot the Bifrost out that's about it, it. it's cool but wouldn't it be accurate it'd be more like just a giant guard castle staying at the top of the Bifrost because if you actually go by a myth uh, Thor couldn't use the Bifrost he had to walk in the river beside it he was too heavy so any of you that have ever seen the um, God of War Ragnarok video game clips, the big heavy Thor would have been act would have been lower accurate, but he couldn't actually pick up the hammer um, unless he had on his gloves and his belt. So even even without his gloves and his belt, he was still the strongest guy, but he only he can lift the hammer because it's so heavy. So. Night Tavi asked, do you have any pagan traditions or ceremonies that you practice that you've been able to integrate or mix in aspects of Jediism? So yes, I have. Um, I have actually adapted a lot of my meditation practices that I use. Um, I have switched to a what I call the nothing meditation. It's where um, I know a lot of people do meditation differently, but I don't focus on any one thing. I let my mind go completely blank. In meditation and your mind will wander here and there so a little course correction to bring it back is not a bad thing um i have integrated some of my own ceremonies that, that i use for for honoring the gods into practices for the with the jedi temple um actually i'm going to be making another altar over here in my room soon it's going to have my lightsaber one of my lightsabers on it sitting right right next to the uh my mead horn that I have sitting right here. So I'm going to integrate both of those together because the, the Jedi weapon, while it is an elegant weapon and omnidirectional, it is not actually an aggressive weapon. It's a defensive weapon. If you read the canon and lore. So the Jedi weren't meant to be warriors. They're meant to be defenders. So I'm going to integrate that defending side with the uh, Norse pantheon, which I believe is, is integral in anything that we do. Anybody else got questions? Bueller. So the next thing you're going to tell me is that uh, the the Marvel version of Thor was was not lore accurate. 
he was cool. I'll give you that. <laughs> but no, Thor would have been built more like um, the world's strongest men. Yeah. You know, if you look at those guys, that's how he would have been built with red hair. Hmm. I can't imagine a, a bigger SOB coming down the road and you're like, nope, not messing with him. That would be about Thor. I mean, you really want to get into the lore. Um, Heimdall had nine mothers. And he was actually human at one point. So he actually lived a human life before he became a god. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Tavi asks, is there any specific animal that you've been working with lately in your paganism and shamanism practices? Um, I would say my cat. He's probably the master of Zen in my house. Um, he, he can lay down anywhere and go in that meditative loaf state that we call it. And, uh, but no, I do have, um, yeah, I would say I do. Um, I honor the owl by Nordic traditions. It's a, it's an animal of wisdom and patience. So for me, that is key because I tend to be hot headed sometimes. So I, I've incorporated that with my Norse paganism, Judaism and shamanism practices as well. Um, if you were here for my shamanistic discussion, you would have heard that, you know, I I often view the owl as my spirit animal, depending upon what stage I'm at in life, because you a human is really dynamic. We can't be the same thing at all times. So some days I could be the wolf um, out there seeking something I need to get done. I could be the bear who's kind of just wandering around and, hey, I found something cool. Let's, let's use this. Or I can be the owl who sits back and uses the wisdom and experience and knowledge to actually find what I need and wait patiently for it to come come to me. So yeah, um, owl is traditionally the one that I work with. I do have some owl feathers in on this bottom shelf down here. I have a toolkit, um, my shaman toolkit. So I, I use that for people who are having issues or need help with something. I'll pull that out and kind of set up my altars here and there to help them out as well. Anybody got anything else? I think we lost Master Roz. It's cool. Uh, Tavi asked, do you, do you do any rune work? Yes, I do. Actually, I have a stave on my hand. I'm sorry, this is a sigil on my hand. So a sigil is anything that's round and or not linear. So this is um, it's also it's commonly known as the helm of awe. It's conflict and protection in endeavors. It's also for luck in endeavors. So it's on my right hand because I'm right handed. So I shake everyone's hand, hand with the right. So um, right hand dominant. So it makes the most sense to be on my right hand. I have one over here, you'll see it upside down, is actually um, the Vistagir. It's a very old old one of it. Um, came from runestones that predate the common one that you'll look up online, which is um, success and luck and safety when traveling. I have three staves on the bottom side of my wrist here. I can't turn my arm that far because it hurts. Um, I have three staves here on the bottom side of my wrist. I have um, insight, strength, and wisdom pointed outwards. So that's what I project to everybody. Um, I have Hugin and Mugen on my upper, on my forearm here with Odin's eye that he sacrificed at the well to gain um, more knowledge and wisdom. I've got a big Viking head on my leg. So yeah, I do, I do use rune work a lot. Um, even the discussing it the other day with, um, I'm going to butcher her name. I'm sorry. Apprentice Marcano. Um, she was talking about a mala. So I have my shaman mala, which is, for those of you that are all up here, these are all hand spun beads on a lay that I have at work. And then I put them all together. So this is the runes three times. So yeah, I, I do do rune work and I carry this with me when I travel for good luck. But it's also one of those things that you can use in meditation if you're just going to count the beads like, like the mala. So you got, you got a little bit of everything. But I do do a lot of additional rune work. I have um, my little binder here. It's my travel binder. For those of you that don't know, I said it's a lot of, a lot of uh, study time. 
goes into all this. I have runes and their meanings, alphabets, um, some of the spell works that I do. I can create my own staves and sigils. Got a lot of different definitions in here for sleep, good health, healing, um, you name it. It's all in here. And this covers everything from a little bit of um, Wiccan practices that my grandma used to use, um, family stuff that we've done over the years. Um, I've got stuff to protect. I got stuff to heal. I got stuff to make someone's feet itch if I don't like somebody, because I can be kind of a butthole sometimes. Um, this is the symbol that I have um, in my house that's used for the entire house for protection. Um, bind ruins. I mean, you name it. I've probably got something for it at least. So. Yes. Yes, I do use runes around my house as well. Um, actually, at the four corners of my property here, I have uh, rune jars buried. Those of you that don't know, um, it's an Appalachian, 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 whatever you want to call it, tradition, to have what's called a witch's jar. I don't know if you've ever, ever heard about it, but it's a certain set of herbs and, and minerals and a person's water. I'll let you figure out how, how to figure, that one fil filters into it into this witch's jar, you put it around your home, so it's supposed to keep you protected. So I have one at all four corners of my property that are all linked together that keep my, essentially keep my house protected from everybody else. And all the storms that have blown have blown through here, I have never had damage to my house as to where my neighbors have. And I live in a, um, I'm in a duplex, so my neighbors are attached to the side of me. My side has never caught any damage at all. So I'm gonna say they work. So yeah, yes, I do use runes around my house. Absolutely love using them. I'll do stuff for my wife when she goes to work some nights. Um, if she's having particular trouble sleeping lately, I will I will slip one under her pillow when she's not looking, or under her side of the mattress for a couple of days. Then she'll then she'll sleep, sleep like the dead. It's 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 horrible. The woman can snore like a lumberjack with a sinus infection. But yes, I do use runes around the house. Anybody else got questions? I can tell you my parents have runes around their house and they don't know about it. So, haha. And uh, my dad's never had a tree branch fall on his house, never had any damage to his house from any storms. His generator always kicks on first on the street. Never had any problems. So, I'm going to say they work. Ah, don't worry, Tab. Your camera's not working. I get it. You can bug me all you want to. It doesn't bother me at all. So just understand that during the work day, I'm not around my phone. I work in a secure space. So, all right. If y'all got no other questions, I got nothing else to to share with you. So, I'm here if y'all need me. You can message me directly in the in the on the temple page and or on Discord. I'll answer whatever I can to help you out. So, I'm here to help. And with that, Tavi, I give to you the remainder 